The other thing is identity. Over the, um, the temple, uh, the oracle of um, uh, Delphi, the oracle of Delphi, you remember the famous thing, know thyself. This is the root of identity, self-knowledge. And I'll be very honest with you, and I say this to you both uh, as a pastor, a person who spent many, many hours uh, just quietly counseling people, dealing with people at some of the most difficult moments of their lives, and as a person who himself goes to confession and who has undergone conversion myself, that the hardest thing, the scariest thing, is to discover who you are. It's really the hardest thing. We think, oh yeah, well this is who I am. I'm, I'm the son or the daughter of so and so, and I grew up here, and I did, and this is my ethnic, or you know, and this is my religion. There's a level deeper than all of that. And what's fascinating, there was a moment in my life. It was when I was in seminary, and we were um, bringing back reports of our ministry. We had this seminar that consisted of us going. I was working in a hospital with dying people and bringing back a report to this class of what went on. It was so revealing. Each of us had to do this with a trained facilitator who kept their eye on what we were doing. I revealed myself in a way I didn't realize I was revealing myself. And when this was pointed out to me, both by my colleagues and by the professor, I was not comfortable with what I was seeing. I was not comfortable with the kind of platitudes that I was speaking to people who were dying, the kind of little things that put everything in order and didn't allow myself and that person to enter the grief and the fear of death. And as I came to understand who I was through the mirror of these people who were being very honest with me, I remember I, I did not want to take that class anymore. It was too intense. It was bothering me. It, it, something bothered me so deeply in my core. And I remember walking down. I could bring you to the very building at Catholic University and to the set of steps. I just came out the door of that hall. And I was deciding, I knew if I left this class, I would have to leave seminary. So this was the real tension. This is the vice I was in. And I asked myself, what is bothering you? What are you so agitated about? What are you afraid to discover about yourself? And at that moment when I crossed that threshold, both literally and metaphorically in my life, I decided I would enter that discovery. The fascinating thing was there was no big hidden thing it was just me and my way of being, the honesty that I had to have with myself. And so knowing who you are, knowing yourself better than anybody else knows you, means that you're no longer at the disposal of other human beings to pull your chain. Now, I've made that sound like it's just a decision. It's really a process because you just make a commitment to knowing who you are. And then when somebody points out something to you that is not favorable to you, but that you know exists, you can say, you know, you're right. And in fact, what you didn't know was this, this, and this, if you choose to tell them. But the important thing is that you know what they're touching on. They no longer control you because your self-awareness needs to be greater than anyone else's knowledge of you. It's the greatest source of peace other than our, I'm a priest so I have to say this because I believe it, other than right relationship with God. It's the greatest source of peace to know yourself, your identity, because then you're not playing to the crowds anymore. Then you're not at other people's behest. If you know yourself better than anyone else knows you, it's amazing the level at which you can help other people because then you can see a person perhaps that you have some managerial uh, responsibility for, and you can see both their flaws and their potentials. 
and then perhaps orchestrate a situation whereby their best potential can come out. You know, we're very generous in judging ourselves. <laughs> we're not so generous in judging other people. But if we know ourselves well enough, then maybe we can use that as the basis for how we evaluate those who we are mentoring. Another aspect, another characteristic I think that's so important, especially in our current culture, so, um, so permeated as it is by constant contact with other people. We are the most connected people. I have had, this morning alone, uh, invitations to link up with somebody on whatever that's called, and <laughs> they put me on Facebook. I still haven't figured out that mystery. I understand the <laughs> Trinity better than I understand uh, than Facebook. And then there's a, yet a third one. We are the most connected people in the history of the world, internationally connected. And yet, the world is probably among the most lonely people. Uh, so what we need here is to carve out for ourselves in the midst of all of our busyness, not just being human beings, not just being human doings, but being human beings. We need to have some time every day to be. For me, it's at prayer in the morning from 7.30 to 8 o'clock, and then I say usually say Mass after that, where it's silent. I use some of the Psalms to begin my day in prayer, and then it's silent. And I meditate, perhaps on the Psalms I find very helpful because it's all of human tragedy, all of human glory, all of human despondency, all of human joy is somewhere in one of those 150 Psalms. And so I reflect on that, and I think about things that I need to accomplish, but not just in the to-do list sense, but in a bigger, broader sense of what to do. So it's a period of each day, for me, as I say, it's in the morning and then a similar period of time in the evening of contemplation, prayer for me. Uh, and I, I encourage you that in your busyness that you carve out some space to just be to think in an unstructured way. We, we have lots of structure, reading is important, all of that formation, those kinds of things, but to just allow the most creative, the most innovative aspects of who you are, your highest ideals, to come out so that that period can be uh, enriching. And it has its um, effect in a practical sense too. I, I call it, uh, in a pastoral setting, wasting time with God. You know, you kind of look at you, oh, I gotta pray for a half hour now. No, no. Just waste time with God. Meditate. Find some form of discernment, what we call discernment. It's sorting out what is the right thing to do here. You know, that, that old uh, pro and con list was effectively invented by St. Ignatius of Loyola as a form of spiritual direction. Put down what the good and what the bad, what the drawbacks are, what the options are, and then allow that to just kind of assemble in your own mind and in your own heart. I'm kind of talking about a more holistic way of approaching tasks. Get a bigger picture, get a bigger perspective on things. And then openness. Now, I'm not talking about being so open-minded your brains fall out, because this, uh, you know, it makes no sense if you, it, it, well, I'm open, you know, uh, I, I very often meet people, we don't wanna, we don't wanna impose our religion on our child, you know? Well, what name did you impose on your child? And what language are you imposing on your child? And what kind of manners are you imposing on your child? 